Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men ve lem. So continuing in our reading and discussion of Qadi Ayaz the Shifa. Uh, we are in section four today, his intellect, eloquence, and acuteness of faculties. He says, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him and may we benefit from his knowledge in this world and in the next. As for his ample intellect, intelligence, the acuteness of his senses, meaning his physical senses, his eloquence, eloquence of speech, the grace of his movements and the excellence of his faculties, there is no doubt that he was the most intelligent and astute of people. So this is an important part of our belief and understanding of the Prophet wasallam, is that he was a highly intelligent person. Not only was he aided by revelation, but he was naturally a highly intelligent person, the most intelligent. Now, this will be why are these type of things important that we that we we say or that we remember? Because later down the line, when we find stories or we find texts that cause us to pause or question or we don't understand, we're going to always come back to these type of beliefs and agreed upon understandings of the character of the Prophet to help us solve those things. Okay, returning to the text. Anyone who reflects on how he managed the inward and outward affairs of people and the politics of the common people and the elite and his amazing qualities and wonderful life, not to mention the knowledge which flowed from him and the way he confirmed the Sharia without any previous instruction, experience or reading of any books, will have no doubts about the superiority of his intellect and the firmness of his understanding. None of this requires confirmation because it has already been amply verified. Wahab ibn Munabbih Wahab ibn Munabbih was a tabi'i. So he said, I have read 71 books and in all of them I have found that the Prophet وسلم, had the most superior intellect and best opinion. Now that sentence, what that means, you have to understand is that the reason I mentioned that he's, I said companion, sorry, I meant he was a tabi. Did I say companion? I said he was a tabi. A tabi. So? No, he was a tabi. When he says, I read 71 books, he doesn't mean I read 71 books like a book like this, because this was at a time in which the information was orally transmitted. So what he means is that at that time of the Salaf, the time of the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Tab Tabi'in, etc., they were people that were collecting manuscripts, collecting handwritten works in which they would codify uh, the Hadith tradition. Now, the Hadith was written at the time of the Prophet, والسلام, which is a common misconception that people have. So when he says, I read in 71 books, that means he was traveling around the, the early community. So he's a tabi, which means that his teachers were the Sahaba. So it means that he, he went and he found in over 71 collections of the hadith that were narrated, and uh, sorry, the hadith that were written down at that time, that this meaning was confirmed. In another version, I found from all of these books that all of the intelligence which Allah had given the people from the beginning of the world to its end is like a grain of sand in comparison with his intellect, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why there's so much, it's so amazing that we still follow his sunnah, that we still follow his way, and we still benefit when we follow it now. So think of the the the... From the, from the point of view of intelligence, think about how amazing that is, is that his life example, still we still follow it, and it gives us, uh, it solves our problems, it makes us feel comfortable and ease, it's still applicable, it's still relevant, etc. Mujahid said when the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, got up for prayer, he could see those behind him as if they were in front of him. 
This affords one commentary on the words of Allah, your turning amongst the people who prostrate. So this is one of the tafsir of the part of the verse, وَتَقَلُّبُكَ فِي السَّجِدِينَ, which we talked about before. So this was one of the Prophet's uh, special traits. His khasa'a says he could see behind him as he could see in front of him. The Muatta of Imam Malik contains the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I can see you behind me. There is something similar from Anas uh, Ibn Malik in the two Sahih collections, meaning Bukhari and Muslim. Aisha Alayhi Salam said the same thing, adding from herself. It is something extra which Allah gave him as additional proof. One of the variants has, I can see whoever is behind me as I can see whoever is in front of me. Another has, I see the one behind my neck as I see the one before me. The different narrations of the same text. So the Prophet ﷺ could see behind him, just like he could see in front of him. Uh, Baqi ibn Mukhannad related that Aisha salam said, the Prophet ﷺ could see as well as in the dark. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ could see as well in the dark as he was in the light. Right? So he had night vision, he could see at night. Just like he could see during the day. These are not khasais. These are special traits that were given to the Prophet. ﷺ. There are many sound traditions about the Prophet seeing the angels and the shayateen. He was able to see the Nijis, uh, the Najashi in Abyssinia, so he could pray on him, the Janazah prayer. Uh, it was in the same way he saw Jerusalem after the night jersey and described it to Quraysh, meaning that when he came back, the following day, and he told Quraysh about what happened, they didn't believe him, he was able to see in front of him the actual spot in Jerusalem, and he was describing it. He also saw the Kaaba, Kaaba when he was building the mosque in Medina. So this is a, 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 um, a miracle given to the Prophet ﷺ that basically space and time were bent for him. So he could see these type of things. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others related that the Prophet ﷺ could see 11 stars in the Pleiades. A Thuraya is a collection of stars, many, many stars. And he could see with his naked eye, if he looked up the night sky, he could see 11 individual stars. Whereas if we see it in the night sky, we see it's like one chunk of light or maybe two or three or something like that. There were very few, but he could actually distinguish 11. So his eyesight, sallallahu alayhi wa he could see far, it was sharp, could see at night, could see things far away, could see behind him, etc. This is according to Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others. They refer to the total, which is which it is physically impos uh, possible to see with the naked eye. One of them believed that this referred to his knowing about it. So somebody interpreted where he knew that there were more, there were 11 stars. However, the clear meaning contradicts this, and there is no impossibility of his having done this. Clear sightedness is one of the special traits of the Prophet ﷺ and one of his qualities. Abu Huraira said that the Prophet ﷺ said, when Allah the Almighty manifested himself to Musa, he was able to see an ant on a stone in the darkness of the night at a distance of 10 leagues. Therefore, it is in no way impossible for our Prophet to have been able to do what we have mentioned in this chapter after the night journey and the favor he received in seeing one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Traditions have come down to the effect that he threw down Rukana in a wrestling match, one of the strongest of his time and called him to Islam. He wrestled with Abu Rukana, renowned with his incredible strength in the Jahiliyyah three times and then the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi threw him every time. So another one of our beliefs is that the Prophet Sallallahu physically was very strong stronger than the average man. Abu Huraira said, I did not see anyone who walked more swiftly than the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was as if the earth rolled up for him. He would exhaust, we would exhaust ourselves, and yet he was not tired at all. The earth being rolled up is a, is a sign of, it's a miracle. It's that they would walk with him. Obviously, there was no public transportation or anything like that. So they were, were walking. And he seemed to walk extremely fast, but never get tired. But the, the Sahaba walking with him, they were overwhelmed and felt, wow, this is like an effort. Another of his qualities was that his laugh was only a smile. 
I mean, he did laugh, of course, alayhi salatu salam, but most of his laugh is a smile. That actually might be a slight mistranslation. Um, it's okay. But it was, the majority of his laugh was a smile. When he turned to face someone, he would face to turn them, sorry, he would turn to face them directly. So if somebody, like somebody came here to talk to me, he wouldn't go like this. Hey, Salaikum, how's it going? He would go like this and he would turn all of him. Hey, Salaikum, how's it going? Like that. He would all, all of him turn, which is a huge sign of respect, right? That anytime you sought his attention, all of him would turn. And when he walked, he walked as if he were coming down a slope. So he would walk slightly, you know, bent forward. Sallallahu alayhi wa Okay. Section five, his eloquence and sound Arabic. The Prophet Sassam's preeminence in eloquence and fluency of speech is well known. He was fluent, skillful in debate, very concise, clear in expression, lucid, using sound meanings, and was free from affectation. So he was naturally and a highly eloquent person, the most eloquent of people, والسلام, he had encompassed the entirety of the Arabic language. And this is something that Imam Shafi'i, he says, can only be done by only a prophet can encompass the entirety of a language, any language. So no matter how good somebody is at language, vocabulary, speaking, they have not encompassed all of it, except for a prophet, والسلام, he was given mastery of language, literally all of the words, and was distinguished by producing marvelous maxims, what we call jawama al-kalim. One of his special traits is that the Prophet ﷺ could convene, convey huge meanings with very few words. He learned the dialects of the Arabs, and he would speak to each of their communities in their own dialect and converse with them in their own idiom. So the Prophet ﷺ, his Arabic was the language of the Arabic of Quraysh. And this is the language in which the Quran was revealed. But there were at that time other Arab dialects. And those dialects, we lose a little bit in the translation and reading this section. But when you read the Arabic of those dialects, it's incomprehensible. I don't understand any of those words. You have to find a dictionary to look them up. They're not words that you usually use. But yet the Prophet ﷺ could stand there and speak to other people of the different tribes entirely in their dialect and in their idioms. So he would use expressions and he would use sentence structures that those people could understand. He answered their arguments using their own style and rhetoric so that more than once a large number of companions had to ask him to explain what he said because they're not used to that type of Arabic. Whoever studies these hadiths and the biography will know and verify that. The way he spoke to the Quraysh, the Ansar, and the people of the Hijaz and Najd was not the same way that he spoke to Dhul Mish'ar, Al Hamadani, Tehfa Al Hindi, Qattan ibn Haritha Al Ulaymi, Al Ash'ath ibn Qais, Wa'il ibn Hujr Al Kindi, and others amongst the circles of the chiefs of Hadramaut, which is in the southern part of uh, Yemen, and the kings of Yemen. Right, so all of these people, they had different dialects. Look at this letter to the tribe of Hamadan. Now, of course, this is translated, so for us, it's going to come across as the English. You have the highlands and the lowlands and the wild lands. You eat its fodder and graze on its range. You have from their produce and fruit and livestock what they surrender by treaty and trust in the zakah. They have the three-year-old camel, the old she-camel, the weaned camel, the one kept in the houses and the young unweaned male camels. They owe in the zakah for the six-year-old livestock and the five-year-old one. So when you read the original Arabic of that text, I mean, I, I understood maybe only two words of that sentence because I, I, I don't even know what those words mean because they're not normal words. He said to the tribe of Nejd, okay, so Nejd out, 
uh, in the eastern part of the peninsula. Oh Allah, bless them in their milk, butter, and yogurt. Send their herdsmen to great wealth and let scarcity depart from them. Bless them in their property and children. Whoever performs a prayer is a Muslim. Whoever brings the zakah is a muhsin. Whoever testifies that there is no God but Allah is sincere. Mukhlis. Benu Najd, another, another letter to, ben, to the people of Najd. Benu Najd, you still have your contracts and property deposits. Do not withhold the zakah nor deviate while you are alive. Do not consider the prayer burdensome and so abandon it. He also wrote to them, you pay the minimum amount in zakah. You have the camel who has been ill, the camel after giving birth, the one who is tamed for riding and a wild colt. Now, of course, in Arabic, all of these are individual words, just one word that she is translating into multiple words. So even in the translation, you can the translator will tell that these are not normal Arabic words. Your livestock are not to be withheld, nor your palm spathes cut. Your milk cows will not be taken as long as you do not conceal hypocrisy or break the contract. Whoever agrees to something must fulfill the contract and pledge the protection, the dhimma. Whoever refuses has an increased obligation as a penalty. So these are all examples, all examples of how the Prophet was able to speak in the other dialects. So it's think about it, it's not think about somebody being able to go to Australia and speak in a completely not only Australian accent but all of the expressions that are common in Australia are the expressions that are made and then going to New Zealand and doing the same thing and then going to you know England and doing the same thing and then flying up to Ireland Scotland and Ireland and being able to do the same things now as English speaking Americans, we can't do that naturally. You can try, but if we went to Ireland right now, there would be we, there would be things that we don't understand. There are the expressions that we wouldn't understand. If you ask for directions, you know you what I'm sorry, can you say that again slowly? Can I, I'm, I'm not I, you, you won't, won't pick up everything. But this year, the Prophet was able to do all of that. Okay, returning to the text. Benun, uh, we did that one. Uh, he wrote to them. No, we did that one. Sorry. Part of, part of what he wrote to Wa'il ibn Hujr was, to the Qaylis, the king of Yemen, the fair-faced ones, the elders. He further said, there is sheep from the minimum amount of 40, neither lean nor fat, give what is in the middle. There is a fifth on the treasure meaning that one-fifth, if you find a, a treasure of gold and silver, what is called a rikaz in the sharia, you have to pay one-fifth of that as zakat. So if there are any treasure hunters out there, that's your zakat. Uh, there's one-fifth of the treasure. Whoever is unmarried and commits fornication, give him a hundred lashes and then banish him for a year. Whoever has been married and commits fornication should be stoned by groups of men. Do not be lax in the deen, nor waver in the obligation due to Allah. Every intoxicant is forbidden. Wa'il ibn Hujr is appointed over the Qayls. Al-Aqyal. Okay, compare how different this letter is compared to the famous ones to Anas about zakah. So if you look at the, the traditional hadith of zakah, if you study like a book of fiqh, and then you, you look at the, the hadith that are agreed upon that describe these issues of the, how many camels do you have to have in order to give to zakah or the, the hadith about the treasure. They don't sound like this when you read the Arabic at all. They, they, as a matter of fact, as I said, when I read them, I didn't understand anything. I had to look in the commentary to understand what those words meant. I mean, not that I'm a, the example of, of the Arabic language, but I'm just saying they're not normal. Even though you've, there are many, many hadith of zakah, None in the books of Zakat have these hadith. He used the vocabulary of these particular people as well as their stylistic metaphors and common expressions, employing this language with them so that he could make what he had, had been revealed for them clear to the people and in order to speak to the people in a way that they could recognize. This is the important part of the section. 
is that when the Prophet ﷺ spoke, he made it clear what he was trying to say, which meant that he changed the, the, the vocabulary, the idiom, idiom, the rhetoric, the expression, so that people can understand, right? That's the sunnah. The sunnah is that we must struggle and strive to find a way to convey this beautiful message in a way that people understand in the language that they understand now. Based on that, our belief as Sunni Muslims is that we say, unless somebody has received the message of Islam in a clear and attractive way, then that person is not considered a disbeliever. So in other words, what's the difference between a believer and a disbeliever? A mu'min and a kafir. A mu'min is somebody who has received the message in a clear and attractive way and accepted it. A disbeliever is somebody who has received the message in a clear and attractive way and rejected it. But the key is the clear and attractive way. Now, what happens if somebody doesn't receive the message in a clear and attractive way? Well, they have never received it to reject it. So they're not a disbeliever, right? Which is one of the big problems I have with all of these Muslims calling non-Muslims kuffar. It's, it's, it's incorrect. It's incorrect with what we believe in. It's not black or white in that regard. So that's important. You see the emphasis that Qadi Ayyad has, this, just this one chapter, which is why I'm spending a little bit more time on it, you see the emphasis that he has on this aspect of the Prophet's speech, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is something, unfortunately, we do not talk about a lot. Maybe because we feel we speak primarily in English, so it doesn't concern us, so it concerns us very much. So one of the things that I personally try to do all the time is try to make all of this stuff clear to you guys in the best possible uh, you know, contemporary English, even the expressions. And the examples that I try to use, I try to use modern contemporary expressions so that people under, so we understand right now what it is that we're trying to talk about. That's very, very, very important. Because if, if, you, if we can't communicate to ourselves, our deen in a way that we understand and in a way that's, that's compatible, in, in a way that may, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna find any relevance, we're gonna become secularized Muslims. We'll only be Muslims when we need to pray, only be Muslims when we go to the mosque, only be Muslims when we, you know, when we get together for Eid or something like that. No, we want to be Muslims all the time. And therefore, we need to communicate to ourselves a coherent, relevant Islam all the time because it's, con it's continually re relevant. Sometimes it just hasn't been presented like that to us. Anyway, okay, back to the text. This is similar to how he spoke in the hadith of Atayya as Saadi. He said, the upper hand. Uh, is the giving one and the lower hand is the receiving one. Meaning, the meaning is that the person who gives the zakah or the, sorry, gives in the charity is given more reward than the one receiving it. But the, the, uh, the way he said it, he said, okay, that part makes sense. The upper hand this is a, a dialect of the one he was speaking to. Uh, there's an easier example that a man came to the that I, I remember off the top of my head. The man, a man came to the Prophet. There was a dialect in when the lamb, like you say, Al Kitab. But in this dialect, they didn't say L, L. They said M, M kitab. The lamb was a meme. So the man came to the Prophet, والسلام, and he said, Hal min ambirri am siyamu fil am safar? Is it from piety that you fast when you're traveling? In the normal Arabic, it would be Hal min al birri al siyamu fil safar? And then the Prophet ﷺ responded in his dialect. He said, Laysa min ambirri am siyamu fil am safar. Changing the lamb for the meme. And this is very common that the Prophet ﷺ would do that. In the hadith, when Al uh, Amiri asked for something, the Prophet ﷺ used the dialect of Bani Amir. As for his everyday speech, famous oratory and his comprehensive statements and maxims, which have been related, people have written volumes about them. 
and books have been compi compiled containing the words and meanings. His speech comprises unequaled eloquence and uncomparable fluency. This is shown by expressions such as, and now he's going to list all of these basically one-liners that the Prophet ﷺ is famous for. The blood of the Muslims is the same. The least of them can offer their protection. They are a single hand against other people. The least of them can offer uh, their protection. A dhimma is an important part of our history and of our religious belief that anybody in the community can offer a safe passage for anybody, uh, any foreigner, any you know, non-group member. People are like the teeth of a comb. A man is with the one he loves. Inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us with the Prophet out of our love for him. There is no good in a company which does not show you what you show them. People are like mines of gold and silver. Ma'adin. The best of you in the Jahiliyyah is the best of you in Islam if they have understanding. Right? Which is a very profound statement because the Prophet is saying there can be good people that just that are not believers because they have good qualities, but they're lacking faith. If you add faith to that, they're also going to be amongst the best of the believers. A man who knows his own worth is not destroyed. The person who is being who is being asked advice is in a position of trust, and he has the choice about what he is going to say as long as he has not spoken. Allah shows mercy to his slave who speaks well and gains, or will, or who keeps silent and safe. Become Muslim and you will be safe. Become Muslim and Allah will give you your wage twice over. These are from the letters that the Prophet used to write to the other heads of state. Those I love most amongst you and those who will sit nearest to me on the day of rising are the best of you in character. Those who give shelter, those who protect and bring together. People he used to speak about, sorry, perhaps, what you, he, perhaps he used to speak about what did not concern him and was miserly with that which did not enrich him, right? People were very happy to engage in gossip, things that don't concern us. But when it comes to things that do concern us, we, we don't address them. That's what he's saying, Asaf Salam. The two-faced person has no standing with Allah. The Prophet Salam forbade gossiping, asking a lot of questions, squandering property, forbidding gifts, disobedience to mothers, and burying girls alive. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fear Allah wherever you are, follow up a bad action with a good one, which will wipe it out. He created people with good character. The best of affairs is the middle way. Answer the one you love gently, lest one day he becomes the one who hates you. Injustice will appear as darkness on the day of rising. La, that's not a good translation. Because it's darkness, where is it? Injustice will appear as darkness. The Prophet injustice, zulumat, plural, is multiple forms of darkness on the day of judgment. Which is why that statement, not only is it short, but why it's so why it's so rhetorically strong is that one form of injustice in this world, the Prophet is saying, will be multiple forms of darkness Yom al -Qiyam. The Prophet said in one of his supplications, Oh Allah, I ask you for mercy from you by which my heart will be guided, my scattered affairs joined together, my affairs put straight, my unseen part put right, and the part of me that is visible elevated, my actions purified by which I will be inspired to write guidance. My intimacy will be returned and by which I will protect, be protected from every evil. Oh Allah, I ask you for a good outcome in the decree, the food of the martyrs, the life of the blissful and the victory and victory over the enemies. We've heard many of these statements before. These are like khutbah topics, basically, right? If Imam Rafai is, is with us, we can, me and him can just take this list of, of one-liners and we can, for the next year, dedicate a khutbah a week uh, to one of these statements because these are heavy statements they mean they have multiple layers of meaning 
There is much more besides this that various groups of people have related about his words, conversations, speeches, supplications, comments, and contracts. There is no disagreement about the fact that in these things he occupied a station beyond compare. He obtained a preeminence in them which cannot be properly estimated. His unique sayings that no mouth had ever uttered before have also been compiled. No one can do them justice. So this is another subsection, which are these are things that no one before in the history of mankind has said. <clears throat> Such as his saying, the fight is fierce. Literally, the evan is hot. Amiya al-Watis, which is now an Arabic expression, which talks about the thick, the, 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 the intense part of battle. Hami al Watis, the fight is fierce. He breathed his last. A believer is not harmed from under the same stone twice, or is, is not. Is it? Whole, not, 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 what did she say? Not stone, but whole. The, the trend, that's not, that's not accurate. The, the, the believer is not stung from the same hole twice. So if you put your hand in a hole and there's like a creature there that stings you, are you going to put your hand in the hole again? No. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying a believer is not going to be tricked twice. Right, fool me. What is it? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So we have a, an English expression that's similar. So the Prophet is saying basically that part of faith is that you know you have to be thinking. You're not going to be tricked twice. If you fall down once and you're tricked into falling down, you're not going to have. That's not going to happen again. Happy is the one who accepts something someone else's warning. And there are many more like these. Anyone examining them cannot cease to marvel at their contents and reflects on the wisdom they contain. His companion said to him, we do not find anyone more eloquent than you. And then he said, how could it be otherwise? The Quran was revealed on my tongue, a clear Arabic tongue. Another time he said, I am the most eloquent of the Arabs since I am from Quraysh and was brought up amongst Beni, uh, Ben Sa'ad because he, he grew up in the outskirts of Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This gave him the strength and purity of the desert, along with the eloquence of the expressions of the city and the beauty of its words. This was, also, this was all combined with the divine support which accompanies revelation and which no mortal can comprehend. Now, why is that important? Why did the Prophet Isasam grow up outside of Mecca? Because in cities, when there is trade and people are coming and going from other regions, the language becomes mixed with other expressions and other words and other idioms. By going out to the desert, the Prophet grew up with people that were only speaking pure Qurayshi Arabic. When Umm Ma'bad declared him, described him, sorry, she said, sweet in speech, distinct, without using too few or too many words. It was as if his speech consisted of threaded pearls. He had a loud voice, which was very melodious, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So this thing about the Prophet's eloquence is really important. It's one of my favorite, if you can't tell, one of my favorite qualities of, of the Prophet, alayhi wa and when we look at, historically, when we look at great speeches or great things that are written, one of the qualities of them is that they are concise, that they are not long-winded. Um, and that's a, very, that's a very important quality. Okay, we'll do one more section, and then we can pause for questions, inshallah. Section six, six, the nobility of his lineage, the honor of his birthplace, and the place where he was brought up. His noble lineage and the honor of his land and the place where he was brought up do not require any proof or clarification. It is not concealed. We all know this. He was from the best of the Beni Hashim and the stock and core of Quraysh. He was from the noblest and mightiest of the Arabs, both on his paternal and maternal side, because both his mother and father, alayhim as they came from the same lineage. 
He was from the people of Mecca, from the noblest of lands, in the reckoning of Allah and of his slaves. Abu Huraira said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I was sent from the best of each generation of the children of Adam, generation after generation, until I was in the generation from which I came. Al Abbas said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah created creation and he placed me amongst the best of them, from the best of their generations. Then he selected the tribes and he placed me from amongst the best tribes. Then he selected the families and he put me amongst the best of their families. I am the best of them in person and the best of them in family. Wa'ila ibn al-Asqa said that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah chose Ismail from the children of Ibrahim and he chose Banu Kanana from the children of Ismail. He chose the Quraysh from Banu Kanana and he chose Banu Hashim from the Quraysh. He chose me from Banu Hashim. In the hadith narrated by Ibn Umar, which at Tabarani was, has related, the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah, the mighty and majestic, sifted through his creation and chose Banu Adam from them. Then he sifted through Banu Adam and he chose the Arabs from them. Then he sifted through the Arabs and chose the Quraysh from them. Then he sifted through the Quraysh and chose Banu Hashim from them. Then he shifted through Banu Hashim and chose me from them. I am the best of the best. Whoever loves the Arabs, loves them through love of me. Whoever hates the Arabs, hates the, them through hatred of me. Ibn Abbas said that the spirit of the Prophet Sassam was a light in the hands of Allah 2,000 years before he created Adam. That light glorified him, the angels glorified by his glorification. When Allah created Adam, he cast this light into his loins. This is what we refer to as a nur al muhammadi the Muhammadan light, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. And just wanted to find Okay. And this is, I think we've, we talked about this before, but this is what, uh, one of the central beliefs that we have of the Prophet وسلم, is that he was the first of the prophets in creation and the last of them to be sent uh, in humanity. And this is what we mean, that he was created as a light, uh, worshiping Allah Ta'ala for 2000 years. And then that light, that genetic matter was placed into the progeny of Adam alayhi salam, transferred generation after generation until his earthly birth, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Messenger of Allah Sassam said, Allah brought me down to earth in the loins of Adam, which is what I just said, placed me in the loins of Nuh, and then cast me into the loins of Ibrahim. Allah continued to move me from noble loins and pure wombs until he brought me out of my parents. None of them were joined together in fornication. And... Uh, this is why these hadith, these two traditions will come later in the book, but this is why we believe and we know with certainty that the Prophet's parents are not disbelievers because it would be incompatible with this belief because he himself said in these sound traditions that none of these people were disbelievers. The famous poem of Abbas in praise of the Prophet وسلم, testifies to the soundness of this tradition. Okay. والله تعالى أعلى وأعلم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. We'll, we'll pause here. Let me put this all away. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. You mentioned that the Prophet Azam wrote. To other heads of state, what what the prophet was he considered a head of state as opposed to the prophet? And can you explain what an Nabi and Ummi really means? So the Prophet وسلم, had many functions. His supreme function, of course, was he was the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi but he also was a head of state. So after he migrates from Mecca to Medina and he forms the state of Medina by making this charter or constitution of Medina, Wathiqatul Medina, he created a plural state. He, he created a state in which there were Muslims, there were Jews, 
and there were pagans, not many, but some of the tribes were still at that time pagans, and he created a whole nation based on that. At that point, one of his fun functions, he became the head of state, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from that time to the end of his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are many, many lessons that we draw from what then becomes our theory of government, what we call a siyasatu sharia or Islamic governance. So, for example, um, when he wanted to start to write these letters to other heads of states, the companions told him, nobody, no head of state at that time writes a letter except that it has a seal and a stamp. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu then took a ring and he wore a ring that said Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu that he used to stamp the letters with. And we have some of those letters are still actually in existence, Alhamdulillah, and you can see that stamp. So that shows you that the Prophet was following diplomatic protocol. He was following what was considered normal at that time in these responses. So he did have, he did function as a head of state. And there's a wonderful, it's only in Arabic, I think, but there's a two volume work by al Kittani. Um, I think it's called at taratib al Idariya, the, uh, the organizational and government examples from the seerah of the Prophet so a lot of that is outlined there. And in the Sira class, we talked a little bit about, about that kind of stuff. But no, he was he was a head of state. Um, as far as a Nabi al-Ummi, al-Ummi is the person that doesn't read or write. So the Prophet did not read or write Arabic, but he spoke Arabic in this most you know, eloquent way. Why? So that he, no one will accuse him of making up the Quran. You know, had he been like a prolific poet writing, you know, lines and lines of poetry, then people will have easily said he, he made this Quran up. But the, the, the fact that he's known as that, as a Nabi and Ummi, emphasizes the fact that this is not from him. The Quran is not from him. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does the upper hand giving and lower hand receiving mean he who gives the charity is better than he who takes it. Yeah, he gets more reward, let's say, because sometimes the person receiving it, it's, it's beyond their control. But gets more reward for that. Are there any other questions? You guys are awfully, awfully silent this evening. You would think that, uh, that you guys got up in the middle of the night to attend class. <laughs> Do I have to start calling people's names? Let's see, who's who's on? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu How are you doing, sir? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I was wondering, just for clarification, um, I was under the belief that the Prophet Sallallahu had um, descendants from Al-Ansar. Was that through his mother or through his father or am I just totally mistaken? Uh, totally mistaken. The Ansar are the, uh, the Arabs of Medina from the tribes of the Aus and the Khazraj. The Prophet Sallallahu is Meccan from Mecca. And a descendant of Beni uh, of Beni Hashim. So I think what I'm recalling is that his I don't know if it's his I'll do that in the Shaitan Ajim, if it was his um one of his um fathers or great grandfather that was taken to Medina and and one of his relatives came back for him for him and went to migrated back to Mecca with him. I'm no, sorry. Not no. I'm, I'm trying to think of if there's a story. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's a story um, that that you might be confused with. But no, his. I mean, the 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 whole point of his lineage is that he is from his family is the family that was in charge of the Hajj of the Kaaba of feeding and and giving water to the pilgrims. 
and that's that's a central part of of his identity because he's he's descendant from that noble stock in other words there's no he's not like an outsider that came for some kind of claim he was already born into that sallallahu if you have something uh, you can send it to me maybe we can work through that by light do you mean the soul yeah, you can think of it as the soul. Yeah, sure. Because remember, we are body, self, and soul. Um, so you can think of it as the soul, of course. But that's what we refer to as the Muhammadan light, al nur al-Muhammadi. Because this is one of those things that people have confusion about, and they think it's like some kind of like Sufi thing or some like extra. No, this is this is Islam. This is what our religion teaches us. And this is uh, one of the, this is a very important part of, the, of our understanding of the Prophet ﷺ. Is wearing a ring a sunnah for a man? Yeah, it's a, it's a sunnah to wear a ring. Um, the, yeah, it can be worn on the uh, ring finger or on the pinky ring, on the right hand or the left hand. So there are all of these different narrations. So all of that's within with the sunnah. Is there I have any a question, Sheikh? Any of the letters of the Prophet were preserved? Yes. Um, the one that comes to mind, I remember the one that I've seen is the one that's in, in Amman, Jordan, in the uh, main mosque in, in Jordan. Um, it's the letter that the Prophet uh, wrote to Heraclius. That is preserved. And you can find a picture online of that. It's very, uh, um, it's, 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 it's there. And I've seen it up close. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh. As we, as you, you were mentioning, as, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had the most beautiful qualities and the, you know, the best character. From your experience, what do you think would be the best traits of a character that we should implement, try to implement first from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Gentleness. Mm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Aisha, Arifq, gentleness is not introduced into something except that it beautifies it. It's not removed from something except that it ruins it. A lot of us abuse ourselves and abuse other people and abuse uh, uh, the privilege that we have been given, uh, abuse the blessings that we have been given. So the most important quality for us today is to be gentle, to be gentle with ourselves, to be gentle with one another to be gentle in our approach to worshiping Allah Ta'ala and following the sunnah of the Prophet That's, I think, one of the most important traits and, and one of the traits that we, you know, uh, it's like low-hanging fruit. I mean, who doesn't want to be gentle? Just take it easy and be gentle. Not, we don't have to be rough and tough. Um, and oftentimes we overlook, we overlook that. And there's this sometimes in, in some people's minds, there's this thing that religion has to be done violently, aggressively. It has to be difficult. And that's not the religion at all. That's not how the religion is at all. That's not how the Prophet ﷺ was at all. So <clears throat> that's, the, that's the, the largest thing that we need. The most important thing that we need. What does a man who knows his own worth is not destroyed mean? That's a good question. Let's, let me see the um, original for a moment. To know your to know your worth is to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you and has given you certain capacities, certain talents, certain uh, blessings. 
You know, Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you come to enumerate the blessings, you will not be able to enumerate them. Allah Ta'ala created you out of nothing. Created you on purpose. Whereas we could have been nothing. We could have been not, not, not created. And if Allah Ta'ala has created us and has touched us with the blessing of life and, and continues to give us life, that means Allah Ta'ala has chosen us. And if Allah Ta'ala has chosen us, that means that we are beloved to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. So if we are beloved to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, we are going to be grateful and thankful to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. That's what your worth is. That's what it means. If you know that, you'll never be destroyed because you'll know that in anything that Allah Ta'ala has placed you, you have the capacity to turn to Him, to make good out of that situation, to draw near to him, to earn rewards, so on and so forth. So by knowing that, you're not going to fall into depression. You're not going to become despondent. You're not going to give up on life. You're not going to lie, steal, cheat, harm people, so on and so forth. Because you know that Allah loves you because he has chosen you. If you forget that for a moment, then you're going to veer away. You know, you're going to veer away from that path and you'll turn. So... That's how you can think of that statement. Any other questions? I wanted to call somebody out. I think she left the call. Um, Okay, if there are no questions, and we can we can end here, inshallah. Uh, hey, Salam. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me? Hey, sorry. You know, I was reading in Ibn Arabi's uh, book yesterday, uh, and he talked about the this light and how um, you know our Prophet ﷺ was created. The light was created even before Adam Salam was was created and how the the seed for the tree of life it's a low tree was the light of our prophet muhammad sallallahu is that something that you can elaborate on or is that something you've read before it just adds meaning to our core belief that the the world was created for the prophet i sallam to be known this is a common expression uh, that, that Muslims have that expresses and encapsulates this belief. And it comes from the tradition in which when Adam السلام, ate from the tree and then sought forgiveness uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the traditions it says that he said, Ya Allah, I ask you by Muhammad that you forgive me or that you forgive us because it was him and Eve. And then Allah ta'ala said, how do you know this name Muhammad? And then uh, Adam said, when you place the soul in my body, I saw written on the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And I, I understand that you don't mention your name except his name is mentioned. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and said, yes, this is true. He is the best of your descendants. And because of him, I created you. So, this is, a hadith is narrated in Hakim. And this is what causes this expression that the world was created for the Prophet Wasallam to be known. So therefore, one way of articulating that is to say that he is, you know, the, as, as Ibn Arabi would write, uh, or, or in, the, in the book that you read, that he is the, you know, the, the tree of life was created from his light, so on and so forth. It's a way to emphasize this belief, which means that, one of the goals of human history was to manifest the Prophet in, in, in the world and that this message be brought forth because this is the only religion that's preserved and will remain preserved 
until until the end of time. So it just further emphasizes that belief. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all, inshallah, to uh, bless the author and to make us benefit from this book and these words. May we find a way to implement them, inshallah, and find our way uh, to develop our own relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك وميداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون See you all next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care and have a good weekend.